Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God, hallelujah. Mm. Ah, I know. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, it's already hot up here. Hallelujah. Just the very sweet presence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this morning, I just want you to with spiritual ears hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. So if you can just give some time this morning just to listen to what God wants to release through his word and catch it, you'll get it this morning. You'll get it this morning. Hallelujah. 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 So last week, the Lord had me minister out, just briefly open up with the, the very breath of God. Whew. And you know, and God says that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every breath that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, it's actually every word, but what I keep on hearing is every breath. I keep on hearing the breath of God every breath and so the Lord he said there's more to this I want to talk to you more on this I want to let you know why you keep on hearing the breath of God hallelujah and then he took me to Genesis 2 7 when the word says that God breathed his breath he breathed his breath and man became a what? A living soul. But I want you to focus on he breathed his breath. Okay? And so he starts talking to me about that alongside with Ephesians 4.13. I mean, this is so powerful. And if Ephesians 4, I'll start with 12. I will start with 11. And he gave some apostle and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Woo! Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he started talking to me about the measure. Yeah. He started talking to me about the measure. And he said, you know why in Genesis that it says man, that he breathed the breath of God and man became a living soul. Now, I'm the kind of person who asks God a lot of questions. I was just sitting in the bed and I say, well, Lord, why did you say that man became a living soul? Why wasn't it just since we're spiritual beings that man just did not become such a living spirit? So the distinction is that, you know, all angels are spiritual beings, okay? But God marked man according to his soul. That, that, that breath that you see that's in there, it says, God breathed the breath. Breath means to just puff a wind. Breathe means, he breathed the breath. Breathe means the divine intellect. The divine intellect. He breathed the breath of God. And God, be I mean, man became a living soul. Yes. He became a living soul. And what God is saying is, when he breathed that breath, there was a measure. Okay? He breathed the divine intellect. You see, when we think of earth and everything else like that, it's measure in time, right? We have chronos time, we have time. 
But God measure the quality of man by his breath. Yes. He measure yes. the quality of man and how he fulfill his plan by the very breath of God. That's it. Hallelujah. Whew, glory be to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory be to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when, when Paul is speaking in Ephesians, and he's saying that, that that man should come. He's talking about the new man, Haria, to the full measure, Haria, of the stature, Haria, yes. that's in Christ. And that word stature means maturity coming of age. Yes. So if you want to see face to face, like how 2 Corinthians 3.18 talks about, face to face, there's a coming up. There's a coming up of a full measure. Because when we talk about revival, when we talk about things being revived, there's only two real components that God deals with. He deals with the heart of man in his very breath. If you see someone that's, that, that needs help or needs to be resuscitated or is not, is not doing well, the only thing that the paramedics deal with is the heart and the breath to bring them back to life. So when we go through the book of Revelation and, and Jesus is walking among the church, he's measuring them up. He's measuring them up according to the full capacity in which God yes. breathed into man. Yes, 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 yes. He's measuring them up. Yes, yes, yes. Ooh. And so that's why when it comes to when a baby is born, the first thing she does, that life is in existence, is breathe. And the last thing that's done on earth, that we're gone, is our breath. And so God says, I measure you by the breath in which I've breathed to you. I measure you, church. He's really talking revival. It's not really about the outside word. It's about the church. Because it's about bringing things alive that was once dead. He has to bring us back alive. It has to be an awakening in our spirit concerning the new man in the full capacity in which the new man is able to fulfill. Every day, I confess, I said Superman has nothing on the new man. God's full potential is operating in me. You know why Superman can't touch the new man? It's because Superman does not have the ability to move things by faith. Everything he does, he has to touch it. He has to physically do it. But we have the ability to say things and it comes to pass. We have the ability to breathe the breath of God and to walk in it. And I'm telling you, this is what revival is all about. This is what revival is all about. And when I was reading this morning, and even concerning what's going to come forth today, hallelujah, even concerning what is going to come forth today, and I'm going to read you this right out of this Charles Finney book. And, 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 and he said, and he's talking about his encounter with God. He said, um, Ooh, glory be to God. He said, without any expectation of it, without ever having the thought in my mind that there was any such a thing for me, without any recollection that I had ever heard that thing mentioned by any person in the world, the Holy Ghost descended on me in a manner that seemed to go through me. Body and soul, I could feel that impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love, for I cannot express it in any other way it seemed like the very breath of God it seemed like the very breath of God 
Hallelujah. And so what the Holy Ghost wants this morning, if you have ears to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying and to catch the breath of God this morning, hallelujah, there's things in Pastor John that's going to be released today. There's things, hallelujah, that's been revving up, hallelujah, for you see the gifts and the calling of God is without repentance. And I call him Pastor John because in God's eye, the gifts and the callings are without repentance. So there's things that's going to flow out and it's not going to land on dormant ears, but it's going to come forth. It's going to proceed out of the very heavens today and we're going to catch. We're going to catch what the Holy Ghost is saying. We're going, it's going to be in our inner being that things come forth. Hallelujah. And there's some things about revival that eyes have not seen nor ears have heard. We have no clue what God has in store concerning what he wants to do in this time and in this hour. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. So, Father, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. We're going to worship this morning. We're going to worship him this morning. We're going to honor him this morning. We're going to magnify his holy name this morning. We're going to praise him with every breath. We're going to come up to the measure. Hallelujah. That's in Christ this morning. We're going to come up to that measure. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. So, Father God, hallelujah. With our worship, hallelujah, we break through the heavens today. Hallelujah. With our worship, Lord God, we break through today, Lord God. this is it. This is just the beginning, saith the Lord. There are things that I'm about to break in on you. There are things that I want to do. Oh, I'm taking you on a journey, saith the Lord. And this journey will ring, bring you right into the shores of glory. So get ready, get ready, get hungry, get thirsty, begin to pull. As you pull, things will begin to come into manifestation and you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. You'll look around and think, I've never seen it like that before. I've never understood it like that before. But all just know there are things that I have in store for you that I have not seen, ear has not heard, either has entered into the heart of man the things that I'm about to bring upon the earth for those that I have loved and I have prepared for this hour. You have been set for this hour. You have been put in a place to move with me. So get in the river. Flow with the river. Just go with the flow. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. Just do as he would want you to do and you'll see things that you will marvel at and think oh my God, this is it. This is it. And this will be it saith the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord's breaking you into another dimension. You're, you're, you, you are being incubated right now for a change. And, and there's going to be a birth and there's going to be an, eleration, an ex acceleration and an elevation into some things that I have brought to your heart that you've been asking me about and you've been desiring to see come to pass and it shall surely 
come to pass mm -hmm. and you'll see it and you'll know it and those things that have tried to trouble you will now be over and you'll step into a freedom you'll step into a freedom you'll step into a freedom that you've known in your heart but it'll be real before your very eyes hallelujah 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 <laughs> ah the lord is good hallelujah well you know we were going to do this brother john i know I, I, go ahead <laughs> There is coming a day you will step in a way that you've never been before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. A new way. A different way. Praise God. A different way. Upward way. Higher and higher. Climbing higher and higher. Climbing higher and higher and higher. Yes, that I'm all beyond that. Yeah. And you'll come to know Jesus in a greater way. Hope and stay. Hope and stay. Hope and stay. Hallelujah. Yeah, Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, hope, yeah, and stay. Yeah. hope and stay. That's hope it. and stay. That's hope it. and stay. Hope and stay. Yep. 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 And those rocks and stones that troubled you, those rocks and stones that got in your way and kept you, making you stumble to keep you from going where I was taking you, now they'll no longer block your way, but you'll use them as stepping stones and you will go to the other side where I'm taking you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what I'm hearing, Miss Perlene. The Spirit of God is going to take you in a place where your ears are going to be open and your eyes are going to see things. And He's going to give you a spirit of grace. The Spirit of grace is going to strengthen your inner man to be able to come back. Because you won't want to come back. But you'll have to come back and release those things. Yes. Yes. Your release things in the spirit that you've seen and that you've heard and there'll be a grace and a strength to do it and be obedient unto it we're going to get the word he's got a word he's sitting on ready but we go with the flow around here. Praise God. Hallelujah. We may get another song. That's okay. We may have to go back to that one. <laughs> but the Lord, early this morning, I was sitting at my desk, and actually I was loading the videos from last night. And the Holy Spirit just said this, right? It's clear as day. He said, those that have come up, come down here from the Atlanta area, and I knew what he was talking about. He said, I, I have an impartation for them this morning. So I'm going to ask every one of y'all that came from Atlanta to come up here to the front. If you would, just come up here and just let, let me pray over you. We're... we're, we're uh, that's yeah you know what I'm talking about yeah you know what I'm talking about our, our northern family delegation that's right that's right that's right Rachel y'all come on up yeah y'all just stand right across the front here praise God 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now, what I heard was the Holy Spirit said they've already got some stuff. There's already been some impartation. But there, there's going to be a deposit made in you today. What we're about to do is going to be part of it. The message is going to be part of it. But everything you've got so far is going to be minimal to what you're going to get right now. Because the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to do something in them this morning. And the Spirit of the Lord specifically pointed me to you, Joe and Tammy. He said they've been in a dry and thirsty land. And I, could, I, can, I, I felt, I know your heart loves God and there's no question, but I felt, I felt some weakness that's been hitting both of you. And it's not, it's not because of anything you've done. It's because there's a cry in your heart for more. And you've come to this place thirsty. And you've been asking God, Lord, I just need you to do a work in me. Because I need to go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do and fulfill what you want me to fulfill. And there's purpose all over you. There is purpose all over you. There is purpose yes. all over you. And it burns sometimes inside. But you're in a thirsty land. And the Holy Spirit says, I want to fill them with something that will carry them. Lift you beyond where you're at and take you into another place where you won't even be able to see what's going on around you as far as what is desolate, what is needing so much of God that's missing. But your world is about to be changed. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 And, and Paul and Christy, what I heard the Holy Ghost say is you've been an anchor where people have been able to come and feel your strength and your commitment and your determination to stay the course. And the Lord wants you to know that there is some rewards a favor that's going to come on your life. Things are going to open for you to be able to minister and touch people and speak into their lives in a greater way than you have. Hallelujah. 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 And I keep hearing anchor. You're an anchor. You're an anchor. You are an anchor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and when you're anchored, then you can become a pillar to where things can be put on you that you can carry. Hallelujah. 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 And so there's some things that you've carried. You've had to carry some in, intimate things. But the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to take you to a place where you don't have to worry about that. Because I'm taking care of that. And now you're going to be able to carry some weightier things that are designed for impartation into others. Hallelujah. 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 And Melody, you're a voice. 
You're a voice. You're a voice. Hallelujah. God said, I, I set her in the church to be a voice. John was a voice in the wilderness. And God said, I, I want her to be a voice in the church. A voice. Hallelujah. And there's been so many things that he has deposited inside of you. Things that keep stirring up and stirring up and stirring up and truth that you keep hearing and things that you see and you know. And the Holy Spirit said, I brought all this to you because I'm going to open a door for your voice. And there are people you're going to speak into that in the past when you spoke, it was falling on deaf ears. But there's going to be a piercing that's going to come into your voice. Where when things are spoken, it's like it's going to stick. And they're not going to just hear it with their ears in the moment, but they're going to hear it on the inside for days and weeks. That's going to continually work on them until they yield to that that voice. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Oh. Rachel, there's things that God wants to do in you in order to work out of you. And even though there has been much that He has done, the Holy Spirit is saying, I've handpicked you. Yes for things that I want to do through you. And the enemy has sought hard to keep you from being able to hear my voice. And there have been many voices that have tried to come and have tried to distract what I have for you. And I'm about to help you to clear the pathway for the communication of my spirit to your spirit to be so clear and precise and accurate that you will become an extension of this voice. And you'll hear it and you'll see it and you'll know it and you'll say, I am convinced that this is the voice of God. And there will not be question in your heart anymore. And there will not be the confusion that you've had to go through. And all the disruption of other voices that have vied for the voice of God. But it'll be clear. And you'll hear it and you'll know it. And that's where your peace will come. That's where all that trouble that you've walked through mentally and emotionally has come. Is too many voices vying for the voice of the Spirit. But once these voices are silenced through your commitment and your dedication to the one true voice, the peace will come. The joy will return. The sense of purpose and belonging will come. And you will find your way you will find your way. Amen. It's like you're walking through a thick jungle right now and you're having to brush back branches to see where you're going. And God said, I'm fixing to give you the machete of the Holy Spirit to cut some paths with determination. With determination that nothing is going to hold you back. Hallelujah. 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 Now, say this after me. <laughs> I, am 
I am in my place. I'm in my place. I will run my race. I will run my race. And the Spirit of Grace, the Spirit of Grace will take me all the way through. I am in my place. I am in my place. Praise God. <laughs> I will run my race. I will run my race. And the spirit of grace, spirit of grace will, take will take me all the way through. I think I think you ought to write that down. I'm, I'm doing it. I think you ought to write that down. Praise God. I'm in the know. I'm ready to flow. And it's time to go, go, go. <laughs> Glory to God. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Praise God. <clears throat> my, my, my. Well, Cola County wants a Faith Harvest Church, by the way. Must have one. Jesus must needs go through Samaria. <laughs> Faith Harvest Church must needs go to Wilcola County. Praise God. Well, glory. Yeah. And He will take me all the way through. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, glory to God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The same glory that is upon the Spirit is the same glory that's upon your Word, Lord. Hallelujah. It's life, 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 the word of life. Hallelujah. So, Lord, spring forth now. Spring forth, praise God. Spring forth, O oh well, glory to God. Hallelujah. I have no title for this message. A spirit ordered and directed life. That's the best I could come up with. But I like, he will take me all the way through. I like that, praise God. Let's talk for just a few moments about first principles. Number one, you must be born again. It's the only way that we can get into the kingdom of God. We must be born again. Church membership doesn't matter. Denominationalism doesn't matter. How good of a person we are doesn't matter. None of that matters. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. And then Paul said, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, whereby God has foreordained that we should walk in them. It is not salvation plus works. It is not salvation. It is not... How, how, how do they say it? How does denominational say it? It's not faith plus works equals salvation. It is not faith plus works that equals salvation. It is faith by grace equals salvation and then the works come. Yes, that's right. But they have to be ordained by the Holy Ghost. They've got to be ordained by God. Amen. Praise God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I could quote it, but we'll turn there. Just, just for a moment. There are seven gifts mentioned here. For I say through the grace of God given unto me for every man not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man. Now the King James says, the measure of faith.
but there's no definite article before pistis. So translators, when they're translating, they've included the. Even though when you're looking at the, the manuscript and when you're looking at the uh, interlinear, the will not be in the italics, but in the actual Greek, it's not there. It's not in the received text anyway. So in some translations, it may be in yours, they, ins they, they place a measure of faith. Which I like that because in the context, we all get a measure of grace. It's according to the gift. Ephesians 4, 7. seven. The gift has, go ahead and say it. Every man has received grace measure of the gift. Amen. And so, here's seven that are listed here. There's prophecy listed here, but notice when he's talking about prophecy. Let's prophesy according to the measure of grace. Me measure of faith. Amen. See, this was the amen corner when we were worshiping. Now it's the correction corner. Okay. <laughs> Keep me straight. Keep me on the straight and narrow corner, praise. And then he talks about ministry, which is service. Yes. Amen. Then he talks about teaching. All of this by, by the measure of grace, uh, measure of faith that God gives. Amen. Yes. Then it talks about encouragement, and then it talks about giving, givers, giving. Amen. Amen. Then it talks about ruling, administration. Yeah. And it talks about mercy. Yes. And I was telling Betty that all seven of these gifts are in the pastoral office. <laughs> Pastor David, Pastor Betty, they operate in all seven of these. And it's out of these seven that, that is spread out throughout the congregation. I had six of them. You didn't have mercy. You, you stole my thunder, brother. <laughs> Patsy had the mercy. Okay. But a healthy church has all these in operation. This is a healthy church. Oh, glory to God. And then over 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, Paul lists the nine manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. And he lists them by by importance. You know, we, like, we categorize them, which is a good thing to do. I mean, that's a good way to teach, you know, the revelation gifts and the power gifts and the vocal gifts. But he starts off, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Two revelation gifts right off the bat. Amen. And then he launches into the wonder-working faith. And then the next two, gifts of healing, working of miracles. Prophecy is, is the last of the second tier. Now why is that? That's rhetorical, by the way. And then discerning of spirits. We all want the revelation. Oh, I want the discerning of spirits. I want to see into the spirit realm. No, you don't. I learned that from John G. Lake. John G. Lake got so deep in the spirit that God began to allow him the ability to see into the hearts of people. The graft the corruption, the sin, the darkness. And it so scared him, he prayed, God, take this away from me. I don't want it. And yet God sees into the hearts of every individual on the face of this earth yeah. continually. That's because he's perfect love. It, doesn't it, it grieves his heart, but it doesn't bother him. It doesn't move him into some type of emotional Whatever. But notice that Paul said this. He says, but all of these gifts are given to every man to profit with all. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's word of wisdom. There's word of knowledge. It's all given by the Spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
And then he says something very interesting over in verse 28. He lists what Dave Roberson calls the eight operations of God. And he starts off first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, gifts of healings, working of miracles, helps, governments or administrations, diversities of tongues, different kinds of tongues. And I was studying this and I was meditating. I, I, I saw this as a building. And at the very top floor was the apostle, underneath that the prophets, then the teachers, and then gifts of healings, working of miracles, helps, governments, and on the very bottom, the ground floor, diversities of tongues. So if I'm walking into the building, I've got to go through the ground floor. <laughs> diversities of tongues to find my way up the building wherever I'm going to be. <laughs> Glory to God. Now please, denominations that teach it's not necessary for Christians to be filled with the Holy Ghost speaking other tongues. Please answer why. Why is that? Why did, why did Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why did he list that like that? River of God. River of God is just flowing. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah, yeah. And this congregation is facing towards the river. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. So that means that all the blessings of God are coming to us. Yes. Amen. Yeah. 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 Preachers. Here's the river of God now. Preachers. Oh, you don't have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. When you get saved, you get it all. Well, yeah, I know that there's some that do, and I know that some that get filled. Some of them speak in other tongues, but no, but you don't have to. It's not for everybody. And they spend their whole life teaching and preaching that to a congregation that believes it, and all the time they're teaching and preaching that, all of the blessings of God are passing them by. So we are either facing the river with the blessings of God coming towards us, or we have our back turned to the river and all the blessings of God are passing us by. That's why it's so important that we study the Word of God. That we be workmen that do not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. So we are born again, and then we follow the Lord... You know, public confession, we're baptized in water, but then we go ahead and get filled with the Holy Ghost and we speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives utter. That's the, that's the Bible evidence, right? Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. Amen? Acts chapter 9, it affirms that He was. It doesn't actually say in the text that He did speak in other tongues, but we know He did. He told the Corinthian church, was not, which was not a small church, that was a pretty large church. He said, I speak with tongues more than you all. And that was a tongue-speaking church too, by the way. So if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, if you do not speak in other tongues, do it. Ask yourself this question. Lord, I'm here in this church that is in the river and I do not speak in other tongues. What is it about me that I don't desire that? Could it be religious tradition? Could it be a sense of unworthiness? I, I want to share something with you. <coughs> Let me <coughs> see if I can find it in my notes. Ceilings are limits. This is a ceiling. We can't go any higher than this ceiling unless we bust through it. And it looks like we're going to have to. Okay? Praying in the Holy Ghost is like climbing a ladder. The more you pray, the higher you get. One rung after another. You come up to this ceiling. Well, I want to go higher. I want to go higher. 
Well, <clears throat> this sealing may be religious tradition, and we already talked about that. Well, you know, my pastor doesn't teach that. My denomination, we don't believe that. Well, Billy Graham said. Well, what does the Word say? You know, i got a funny... i, I got to share this, okay? 1975. I am thoroughly, 100% certain denomination, which David has already mentioned, but I'm not going to. And we hear of a man by the name of Brother Hagen. And so what was her name, the Sunday school teacher? Burns. Burns. She arranges for the young people in that time, you, know, you may not believe this or not, at that, back at that time I was a young person, <laughs> to take a trip down to Leesburg, Florida to hear Brother Hagen. Yep. So I said, okay, y'all are going, I'll go. So I hop on the bus and we go down to Leesburg. And we pull into a Baptist church. And here I am. I am thoroughly Pentecostal denomination. What is this man doing preaching in a backslid church that's going to take the mark of the beast and go straight to hell? I'm serious. 100% baptized in religious tradition, denominationalism. So we go in there, we're on the back row there, we're bound in the term. We're going to show these people what Pentecostals are, you know. And I, you know, I don't even remember what, do you remember what Brother Hagin preached? I don't even remember what he preached. I knew it had to be faith. But come towards the end of the sermon, he starts lining people up to pray for him. And so that's fine. I says, well, you know, that... I don't know that person. I don't know that person. I don't know that person. So I'm sitting back there. This can't be God. This is not my denomination, so this cannot be God. So the service is over. Get on the bus. Go home. Patsy, everybody else on the bus, they're worshiping God. I mean, tears are flowing. I mean, they're just glory and singing in the Spirit. And here's John Dunning. And I get home and I get thinking about it. I got, you know, I got to process. You know, that's the way my mind is. You know, some, you know, somehow I got to process it. So I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is really wise. Maybe he knows something I don't know. Or <laughs> I come to find out there's a whole lot Brother Hagin knew that I didn't know. <laughs> So I said, well, you know, I'm just, I'll get, I'll get, I think I borrowed a book or two from you or something. Or you gave me a book or something like that. And so I got to read and it was on healing, I believe. Yeah, it was on healing. And, and I got, you know, a little way into the book. And I says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If this man knows anything about healing, I know my denomination knows a whole lot more about healing than he does. After all, we're Pentecostal folks. And we don't go preaching in Baptist churches. <laughs> So I went and found, you know, a, a book from the, you know, one of the heads of the denominational church on healing, and I went and got in there and started reading it. It was the most confusing mess I've ever seen in my life. I couldn't make heads or tails of what he was talking about. So I set it down, and I picked up Brother Hagin's book. I mean, it was just as clear and concise as simple. I mean, simple enough for me to understand. And so that got me thinking. That got me on to a trail, amen, of what we experience here. But I want to get back to Joe Stonecipher. He's sitting in the back, all right, right where brother is. And he says, I know what they're doing. They run an electric grill all the way across that and they cover it up underneath the carpet. And so whenever these people come up, and whenever Brother Hagin gets ready to lay hands on them, somebody pushes a button or switch or something like that, and the shock just knocks them over. And he said, but I know I've got an electrician's shoes on that absorb the shock. So I'm going up there. I'm going to prove this whole thing is nothing but, a, you know, just makeup. And so he's up there, you know, and Brother Hagin, <laughs> I'll never forget it. 
Brother Hagin lays hands on him, and you should have seen the shock on his face. Paul, oh, I doubt, and he just falls right over. There wasn't any electric thing running underneath the carpet. That was just the electricity of the Holy Ghost. Right. So I got to thinking about that. And the more I read, I began to read more of Brother Hagin's books. And I began to understand, you know, Brother Hagin knows more than we know. And uh, I think David and I think you'd already made the break. And I came a little while later. I always follow behind for some reason. And uh, when I heard, and what caused me to break from that denomination, when I heard that somebody that had lost his wife in a car wreck, she was burned up to death, burned alive. And he was given the head of a Sunday school class and he had the audacity to say that God got glory out of what happened to his wife. That was it. I was usher captain that Sunday morning. Now I was, yeah, I was usher head for that Sunday. I grabbed the bag, I gave it to the usher captain and said, here, you take this, I'm, I'm out of here. And I never went back. Started going over to, what was this? Living Word, Ron House. And he's the pastor that started teaching us about the gifts of the Spirit, how to, how to move in the gifts of the Spirit. And he came out of Ramah. Make a long story short, that's where, that's where we wound up. We wound up at Ramah. And now you know the rest of the story. Religious traditions, that's, that's, a, that's a strong spirit. And, and sometimes we live our whole life and we never, 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 never get out of us all the religious tradition that we were taught in denomination. Now, <clears throat> I don't hate denominations. Don't misunderstand me. But we have to speak up when denominations are not teaching and preaching the Word of God. Amen. It's like what... <clears throat> remember? Remember what... Uh, the Pharisees came to Jesus and uh, they saw the disciples eating with unwashed hands. Remember that story? I think it's Mark 7, I believe. And the Pharisees pointed to Jesus' disciples and said, Why are your disciples eating with unwashed hands? You know, that is contrary to the tradition of the elders. Religious tradition. And you know what Jesus called the hip, called the uh, I already told you. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites. And he says this. He says this. You do away with the word of God so that you might hold to your traditions. And that's an issue, a major issue in denominationalism. They do away with the Word of God so that they can cling to and hold to their traditions. That's why we have to... Well, let me say it this way. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, But the natural man receives not of the Spirit of God, for it's foolishness to him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But then Paul says... But the spiritual man discerns all things. What are the all things he's talking about? All things good, all things of God, all things that are not of God. You know, Paul describes the spiritual man, and, and Pastor David brought this out, Hebrews chapter 5, about the, how the, the spiritual man, the mature man, the man of full age, can discern both good and evil. And then he says this, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Yes, yes, yes. And so we ask ourselves the question, who is the we Paul is talking about? Is it we, the whole church at Corinth? Or is it we, 
the spiritual men? Well, you know the answer to that. And he wasn't talking to the Corinthian church, okay? Because he said, How be it? I cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Flesh ruled. He said, You don't you, you can't handle the meat. I'm feeding you the milk. That's all you can take. But you can't take the meat. Amen. Why? Because number one, the word of God is not first is, is not first place. And secondly, you know, we're paying more attention to our emotions than we are to the Word of God. Well, I don't feel like I'm good. So I'm not good. Well, I feel pretty good. I must be good. Well, I feel bad today, so I must be bad. What's wrong with me? Where have I sinned? Oh God, forgive me. Yeah. Pastor and I have been married. We're up in that one bedroom apartment on May Street. Right after that's after we got married, of course. <laughs> Thank God. Yes, amen. <laughs> And uh, Patsy got sick. I mean, lay down in the bed sick, running a high fever. And you know what my thinking said? This is when I was still denominationalized, okay? It's my fault. I know it's my fault. I haven't been praying like I should. I hadn't been reading my Bible like I should. So here I got my Bible, I get down on the, in the living room, I get down on my knees and I start cry, crying and moaning and groaning and asking God to forgive me and filled with guilt. And right in the middle of my pity party, the Holy Ghost says, grab that Bible and open it up. I throw it on the floor. It opens up. I look on it and it turned to Matthew. And I was in chapter 3. Verse 17. And those words, when I fixed my eyes on those words, they enlarged and lifted up out of the Bible. 3D. Thou art my son in whom I'm well pleased. Oh, wow. Woo, buddy, I tell you what. I started shouting. And you know what? The very moment that happened, Patsy yelled from the back room, I'm healed! <laughs> Fever's gone! <laughs> She got up, fixed me something to eat, praise God. <laughs> got to feed the spirit man, you know. Religious tradition. Let me tell you what another ceiling is, a sense of unworthiness. Ingrained in us. Amen. Amen. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Every human being on the face of this earth has worth. Everyone. Patsy's got a brother. When that brother was being raised at home, her daddy would say, you're no good. You'll never be any good. You'll never amount to anything. His whole growing up life, that's what he was told. He grew up Three failed marriages. Babies out of wedlock. Got into sexual addiction. Spent time in prison. And is still not free. And he's older than I am. See, that, that was ingrained in him. Now, I don't know how you were raised. I don't know what happened. But God knows. Let me tell you something. If there's a sense of unworthiness about you, and believe me, we had, we had some hereditary traits in our family, didn't we? Strong spirits of rejection. Amen. That uh, you probably dealt with it. I'm dealing with it still. Keeping it under. Amen. That's just, just something you've got to deal with. God's grant me, granted me liberty and freedom. Listen, when I was growing up, I could not get behind something like that. I could not be in a room of more than five people without breaking out in a cold sweat and unable to say anything. Mumbling, stumbling. 
Amen. But but over over the years, doing what I'm gonna what I'm gonna tell you that I did and others have done and what you may be doing now or you may not be doing now. I don't know. But the Lord brought me out of it. Now I do have a tendency when I walk into a large group like this and I sense a foreign spirit, it, I want to draw inward. And that's not the way to handle that. You attack that spirit, praise God. Don't let it grab hold of you. Praise the Lord. Amen. That, that doesn't happen as often as it used to. Amen. <coughs> I guess because I'm getting older. Amen. Yeah. A sense of... Now, I picked this up. I read this out of a medical journal many, many years ago. And in this journal from this doctor... He gives the four leading candidates to cancer. Number one on the list is an inability and an unwillingness to forgive. Number two is self-pity and depression. I was prone to that when I was growing up. Especially after I got married and started raising children. You know, I was, it, you know, finances was a constant issue when we were first married. And so I, sometimes I'd start thinking about the lack of money. And I'd start getting depressed. And things would get so bad, I would go into a darkened room, like that room back there, and sit in a chair in the corner and turn my problems over, over and over and over. I remember my brother coming over to the house one day to visit me. And that was working in me and on me. And he, we had not been in a conversation for two minutes, and he said, Brother, there's a spirit of oppression on you. I couldn't identify it. Didn't know what it was. All I know is, at that point in time, that was me. And then one day, as I started getting the Word, started getting in the Word of faith, starting to understand some things, starting really starting to, to, to pray and, and begin to... to uh, to mold, allow the Holy Spirit to mold my inner man, that depression came on me one day. And so here I am, I start sinking, and all of a sudden I, I said, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have to give in to that. I don't have to yield to that. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, leave. And lo and behold, that spirit left. It tried to come back a few times, but I did it the same way. It's like when I first started pastoring down in Sop Choppy, we were out in the country, and there was a fella, and this guy was uh, had a lot of emotional problems. And uh, he, he, he would lose his emotions, and he would like, it was almost like he would go, he would hyperventilate. And uh, it got so bad he would have to take some drugs, calm him down. And he started sitting in on the faith sessions about authority and how to believe God, how to walk by faith and not by sight. And he told me, I went by to visit him one day, and he told me, he says, you know, I had one of those panic attacks come on me, but I said, no, in the name of Jesus. And just like that, it was gone. And then something happened. He got this idea in his head that the women were running the church. And I'm not disparaging of women, okay? And he thought that women were controlling me. And he couldn't get, I couldn't get it out of his brain. And so he left the church. And so a little while later, you know, I went to visit him. That same thing came on him. But this time he didn't take authority over it. And he was back on the medicine. And then I found out later he had to be taken to a hospital. And then I lost track of him. See, just because we get momentarily free, that doesn't mean the devil's going to leave us alone. Remember when Jesus was in the, in the wilderness being uh, uh, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? You know, I like the way uh, Luke records how that after his 40 days was over, then the devil came to him to test him. 
But after Jesus successfully stood upon the Word of God and ran the devil off, the Scripture says, and Satan left him for a season. He's always going to come back. See, he's, he's 100%. As much as, as God is for goodness and holiness and truth, that's exactly how much the devil is for evil and wickedness. Remember the, the parable that Jesus spake? He was talking to the Pharisees. Talking about how a spirit goes out of a man. And he walks through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he says, I will go back to my house. And he goes there and he finds it clean, swept, garnished. And then he invites seven other devils in. And the last state of man, that man is worse than the first. See, a lot of people get, de get delivered, you know, and all, all of that, that's, that's the curse that's upon them is taken away, but they don't fill, any, they don't fill that vacuum up with what they're going to need to stay delivered. You know, people on addictions. You know, I mean, I, I used to minister at a, at a uh, it was kind of like a halfway house. And guys in there, instead of going to jail, they sent them to this ministry where they could be ministered to. And I tell you, there's a lot of guys in there, man, they were 100% Bible people. I mean, yes, amen. The Word of God is truth. Yes, amen. And then they get out. Then the next time I see them, they're right back on the drugs. You see, they were clean, but they didn't put anything back in. They didn't put that back in that was going to keep them free. Amen. You know, I've been doing a little reading on how the military trains their soldiers to stay up. How many have been in the military? Did you have 24-hour duty? Did you ever have 24-hour duty? You had to stay up all night? You got trained how to do that? Or there were, there were things you were taught that would keep you? up all night just did it you did it or else right <clears throat> you had a lot of self determination with that drill instructor that sergeant behind you right well I was thinking you know I read where soldiers stayed up for 48 hours 72 hours they stayed up so long they were, they were watching helicopters and they thought they were flying birds just hallucinating and I got to thinking, I said, you know, I mean, if the military can cause men and women to stay up all night, why can't the army of God take its soldiers and put something on the inside of them to where they're willing to pray all night? I mean, that's what Paul young Cho did in South Korea, right? That's what other churches have done. Pray all night. Friday night, pray all night. Amen. Well, he really doesn't know anything. I mean, he's only got a church of how many thousands? Hundreds of thousands? Amen. Inability, unwillingness to forgive, self-pity, depression. Number three, inability to maintain long-term relationships. Oh, I love you. I love you. You are the best pastor in the whole world. You know, I was praying one day. I was saying, Lord, we need Brother Hagen. Send Brother Hagen. And the Holy Ghost spoke up and said, But I sent you one that was trained in his school. And oh, I love you, pastor. I'm so thankful. And I step on her toes. We're leaving. You know. Friends to the end, and now this is the end. Walk right out of the church. Had a teacher on Wednesday night pointed one of the students out and said, you're going to hell. Come to find out, they were having a dispute. And so she took the authority that was given to her, amen, to accuse her and to point her finger at her and demean her and judge her. Well, I removed her. She left. And all her family left with her. 
And she's the one that had to deal with cancer. Inability to maintain long-term relationships. We have to learn that we have to accept people a lot of times the way they are. I think Betty said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Help people as much as they can, but don't write them off. Well, you don't tithe, so you're out of here. That's what the Greek Orthodox Church did to our granddad during the Depression. Going to church. The Greek Orthodox priest came to Angelo and said, I've been checking records and you haven't been tithing. I don't have any money. If you don't start tithing, I'll excommunicate you. Sayonara. Never went back to church. See, the inability to maintain long-term relationships. Because we're carrying around phileo love when God all the time has deposited agape. That's right. yeah. I mean, has God cast you off? Because you're not perfect? How many things have you done wrong? Don't raise your hands. This is not testimony service. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I've done some pretty awful stuff. Amen. Which you'll never find out about. Because it's under the blood. Inability to maintain long-term relationships. Failure to mortify the deeds of the body. That's a, that was a big one with me. Still is. Cassie let the cat out of the bag last night. Shame on you. I got into this thing, and I don't mean to, to, to use profanity, but I got into this word, word called dang. That dang thing. You know, and something ain't working right. You dirty dog. I remember one time we were building the church and uh, my church loved me so much they had a pastor Christian day and gave me a carpenter's apron and on the apron they put bent nailed carpenter. Because I'd go to strike a nail and I wouldn't hit it flat on the head and the nail would slip off and hit my thumb. I'm surprised this finger survived. I really am. I had that thing all scarred up. And I was trying to hammer a nail into a piece of wood and it wasn't going in. I mean, it was, the nail was going to the left. I'd straighten it out and it'd go to the right. And I got so mad at that piece of wood. I said, if you were alive, I'd beat you half to death. And I was already doing that. I mean, <laughs> that piece of wood was a mess. Amen. <laughs> Failure to mortify the deeds of the body. See, the things that are lodged in us, the things that we bring over from the netherworld that we've never really dealt with, the only way that we're, they're, they're going, they are going to be excised out of our life and put to death is that we have got to do it by the Spirit. Yes. 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 But if by the Spirit yes. you mortify the deeds of the body. Praise the Lord. Lack of initiative in prayer. That's another issue. That's another ceiling. Well, we get a hold of praying in tongues. Whew, man, I'm going to be a prayer warrior. So we get in there, buddy. We start praying. We, we, I tell you what, we pray out 15 minutes and think we've hung the moon. And then we keep at it. We keep at that 15 minutes. Keep going, keep going. And then all of a sudden we graduate to 30. Then we graduate to an hour. And then we graduate to two hours. I tell you, we're flying high. Woo! We're Superman. We are flying through the air. Everything is beautiful. We're singing that song. And I'm not going to sing it. Everything is beautiful. 
And then all of a sudden we hit a snag. And what happens? Well, in the next couple of weeks we find ourselves right back into our prayerlessness. Right back where we came from. We were climbing that ladder and all of a sudden something happened and we decided to descend. We go right down on the floor and we do this. We start up, we go down. And we never break through that ceiling. It's because we have never trained ourselves and we have never disciplined ourselves to set aside specific times to pray. And we do not allow distractions to get in our way. Amen. We do not allow ourselves to be pulled. Now, there's sometimes there's emergencies that pull us away. Amen. But we do just like John G. Lake said, when I go, I pray. And while I'm praying, I'm going. But you know, that's good. And we need to do that. But it doesn't take the place of that quiet communion when you're face to face with Jesus. Yes, yes. Praise God. Amen. So that's a hindrance. That's a ceiling. We need to break through that ceiling. Amen. And then failure to abide in the Word of God. We start reading commentaries. Daily devotions. Books. That's something I discovered about me. As I was spending all my time reading Brother Hagin books and not spending any time in the Word of God. Well, I was getting some of the Word and what Brother Hagin was teaching. It was the Word of God, but I wasn't reading the Word of God for myself. When I was in the denominational church, I was reading the Bible, but I wasn't reading anything else. And I really wasn't spending that much time reading the Bible if you really want to know the truth is. Failure to abide. Notice that. Failure to abide. Failure to live in the Word of God. Hey Amen. I know y'all are getting tired. And I'm just getting I'm just getting wound up, praise God. Failure to abide in the Word of God. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Shall be. Shall be. Shall be done. So how do we become that spiritual man? Well, we've got to abide in the Word. And then we've got to pray in the Holy Ghost. Let me, let me read you these prayers real quick. There's a, I've got seven listed. Uh, let see if I can find them. Here they are. You've got the prayer of agreement. That was talked about. You have the prayer of faith. That was talked about. You have the prayer of thanksgiving. That's the prayer of praise and worship. You have the prayer of intercession. You have the prayer of supplication. You have the prayer of consecration. All these are conditions. They're based on conditions. You can't take the prayer of faith and use it as a prayer of intercession. It's not going to work. I mean, different rules. It's like how Brother Hagin taught us. Different types of prayer have different rules. You can't play baseball with football rules. It's just not going to work. But there's one kind of prayer. It's called praying in the Holy Ghost. That when you begin, the Spirit of God all, already hooks up with you. And He'll stay with you. All the way through. Praise God. Amen. And when you start praying, He's with you. When you stop praying, He stops. When you start again, He starts. The problem is, you know, we, we, don't, we start, but we don't stay long enough praying in other tongues, praying in the Spirit. Amen. There's some things, it's like this. Well, I better not do that. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, in the Greek language, uh, pres prepositions express relationship, just like they do in the English. Who is there? Somebody here is an English teacher. Okay. Now you correct me if I'm wrong. I'm from the English side. Okay. <coughs> but in, now, in the Greek language. <coughs> Prepositions have three expressions. 
Preparation, uh, prepositions are either motioning towards the object or they're resting in place with the object or they're separating from the object. You see, and to me that describes perfectly the Christian life. If we're abiding in the Word and we're praying in the Holy Ghost, I'm talking about quality time. Enough to build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Then we're motioning towards Christ. If we're in the church, we're born again, we're filled with the Spirit, but we're really not praying like we should, and we're really not spending time in the Word of God, we're just resting in place. In other words, we're not going anywhere. But if we get out of church, we get out of prayer, we get out of the Word, and we start partying with the world, we're separating ourselves. Amen. Peter described it this way. Constant, continual renewers, renewals of the Holy Spirit. Mm, that's good. Every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we go into that prayer room, praise God. Yeah. And we start praying in the Holy Ghost. And we get, we get enough of the Word of God on the inside of us. It's after 1 o'clock. Praise God. <laughs> amen. I know y'all said, oh me. I was saying amen, okay. And so here we are praying. And we got enough of the Word of God on the inside of us that we start meditating that Word. And it's like a perpetual engine. Just keeps going. Keeps going. Keeps going. Then all of a sudden, here comes light. Things we never thought of before. I was med meditating on John chapter 4. You know, and when I was... I can't even get to fasting. That's the one thing I wanted to talk about today. And I was uh, been studying and meditating on fasting. And I got over to John chapter 4 and all of a sudden I asked myself this question. I said, wait a minute now. That Jesus and the disciples walked from Jerusalem to Sukkar in Samaria. That's about 30 miles. They made it by noonday, which means they started at daylight. Took them six hours over heavy terrain to walk 25 or 30 miles. Do we have any volunteers? When Jesus and the disciples get to the well, he, Jesus sends the disciples into town, which is another mile or two, to get food. But it says, being wearied from his journey, sat down by Jacob's well. Now, the question that came to me is, wait a minute now. Jesus does not have a death doomed body. He is perfect humanity. No sin at all in Him. How is it that He was wearied from the journey, but the disciples were not? Why is that? Well, the only one answer that I could come up with, maybe you, maybe you can come up with something, is that He was fasting and the disciples were not. We have this idea, you know, we hold Moses up and we say, wow, Moses, he was some kind of fella. I mean, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He did it twice. He didn't eat any food, didn't drink any water. How did he do that? And then when I was meditating this, all of a sudden I realized he entered into the glory cloud. He was in the presence of God. God was sustaining his physical body. In the entire 40 days, both times, he never hungered, he never got thirsty. He never held up his hand and said, uh, Jehovah, can we take a break? I'm tired. And I believe that the entire time that he was in 40 days, that, that's earth time, okay? That's not spiritual time. There is no time in the Spirit. It seemed to him like it was just a few minutes, but it had been 40 days. See, to me, that's not a chosen fast. He was called up into the glory. Required no effort of his own other than just walking into the cloud. What's it, what is heaven going to be like? My, 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 my. Walking right into the glory cloud. Glory to God. Man, that just came all over me. Glory to God. 
And then Elijah. Elijah is another one they talk about. You know, defeats the armies, of, I mean, the, the prophets of Baal, and the next day he's running from Jezebel, and he's out in the desert, and he leaves his servant in another place, goes another day in the desert, sits under a juniper tree, and an angel comes, gives him food and drink. And the angel comes again, gives him food and drink. And the angel says, because the journey is too long for thee, the journey is... Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm closing with this. The journey is too long for thee. And the Bible says that Elijah went in the strength of that food. You know what the word strength in the Hebrew means? The power of God. God supernaturally sustained him for those 40 days and 40 nights in his journey. That's not a chosen fast. The thing that stands out with the Lord Jesus is this. That when He went into the Jordan River and was baptized, it was a baptism of consecration to fulfill all righteousness. Luke records when He came out of the water praying, the Holy Ghost came upon Him. He leaves Jordan... Mark records, is driven into the wilderness. That word driven means urged. It's like taking, you know, it's like, you know, I, I'm an ornery individual and my brother is fed up with me. So he grabs me by the arm and says, here, I'm going to take over. You, you and I are going to have a little conversation. That's what that word means. Fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Ate no food. Now, how I know that Jesus did that in His own strength without angels helping Him, without any assistance from heaven, just the fullness of the Holy Ghost that was upon Him, just like you and me, how do I know that? Because Matthew records that after the 40 days of testing, angels came and ministered unto Him. And that word minister implies a waiter who waits at a table and supplies food and water, food and drink. So that tells me that the angels had to give him enough sustenance to get him up so that he could go into Galilee. But when he went into Galilee, he went in the power of the Spirit. Went in the power of the Spirit. So we see the power twins. Praying in the Holy Ghost, adding fasting to our life. Amen. And I found this out to be true. Listen, four months I've been on a journey. And it started out rough. I was down with shingles for the whole month of January. And I tell you what, I was in pain. How many have ever had shingles? Yeah. You were not on a vacation, were you? But I'd learned long ago, you know, something like that happens. You know, you need to double up on your word. You need to double up praying, you know. You need to do this. And, and so here I was, man. I was listening to Brother Hagan, you know, eight, eight hours and hours a day. You know, believing God for my healing, and healing was not coming. Finally, I had to go to the, what do they call it, urgent care. I had to go to urgent care, and they gave me some medicine that wasn't the kind of medicine I needed. So I went to... Our family doctor, nurse practitioner gave me, you know, pain pills and this, that, and the other. And Well, it helped a little bit. The thing I hate about shingles is that you feel like, you feel like bugs are crawling all over you. Those, those electrical, you know, charges in the nerves, that's what you feel like, man. I tell you what, well, I won't go into any gory details, okay? <laughs> We'll just say, we'll just say I had the shingles. Right? And uh, so healing wasn't coming. Lillian B. Yeoman said this, if you pray for something and you do not get an answer, then you are the one that's going to have to change. So I began to ask myself the question, what is it about me that I'm not getting healed? So I started a self-examination. 
Well, one of them, one, one of the problems was diet. God had already talked to me about diet, and I was getting back to the way I used to eat. As a matter of fact, confession is confession good for the soul. <laughs> I put on 13 pounds over the Christmas holidays. I'm telling you what, they changed my name to Mikey. <laughs> You know, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Oh, no, I, I believed I was eating the whole thing. I mean, it was, it was a mess. Well, let me tell you something. When I saw that, and I saw that that sin was depriving me, depriving and not allowing the Holy Spirit to heal my body, I changed that immediately. And I lost that 13 pounds in no time at all. And then there were some things I was holding in my heart against a certain ministry that had harmed my family. And I'd held, uh, held that against that, that ministry for all these years. So on purpose, you know, the, the, there was a, a meeting in my area on, my, on purpose. I went and I sat under that ministry and I gave that ministry an offering. And right in the middle, right in the middle of that session and repenting, all of a sudden, all that just flew away. Just gone. Clean. I left that meeting feeling so free. So clean. Praise God. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord so that we'll not be condemned with the world. And so, what do you do when you're a child? What do you do when you got into trouble? Where'd you go? I'll answer it for you. You went home to Mama. I remember one time there was a bully on the neighborhood and I was out in the street and I was causing some kind of a ruckus and that, that bully come rushing out of the house. I saw him, buddy, I took off for home. Because I knew I was safe under Mama's skirt, okay? So we run home to Mama. Well, I ran home to the things that turned me on to a lot of the things that that uh, you know that we're doing now. So I went back there. I, there's one particular book. Uh, you know, I started. I'm gonna read this all over again. You know, so I started reading it. And then in the meantime, I don't know if you know this guy. His name is Sam Dunning. You know him. He sent me some YouTube videos of a revival going on over in Mobile, Alabama. And I started watching them, and I said, man, you know, I didn't even know. I didn't even hear about this revival. And I live closer to Mobile than he does. He heard it, and I didn't. Imagine that. And so that, that just kind of got me going in this direction. And between that book and, and watching what God was doing with other people, I said, you know, I used to, I used to commit every day to tithe 10% of my day to praying in the Holy Ghost and got away from it. And I just, you know, I'll make this confession to you. There was times in 2020 I wasn't spending that much time at all praying in the Holy Ghost. Just a little bit. You see, getting down off that ladder. So I said, well, you know what? I'm getting back up on that ladder. So I started praying. Started praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost. 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 Started listening to sermons. And this one particular minister that I like listening to, he starts talking about fasting. And let me tell you something. If anybody mentioned fasting in my lifetime, I closed the book, I left the room, I hopped, I hopped the flight to Jamaica. I'm out of here. <laughs> we went through a book, you know, shaping history through prayer and fasting. Boy, I tell you why, I loved every part of the praying, but I just... Fasting? No. Kind of like, you know, back in those days when religious tradition. Well, I'm going to start doing that. So I started skipping evening meals. And I'm coming to a close, okay? You know, that, that, that thing that they taught us in Bible school, you know, that the sea can only en endure what the mind... Yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, I don't, I don't pay attention to that anymore. But anyway, start praying, start fasting. 
And lo and behold, somewhere along the line, fasting ceased to be a sacrifice. And it began to be something I long for. It began to be something I look forward to. Because God was in it. Because He was in it. That's why this conference has been a world changer for me. Because I was struggling Friday. I was struggling Saturday. Saturday morning, I was struggling. I was fasting all that I could. I was praying in the Holy Ghost all I could. I don't know what, what was wrong with me. I don't know what was wrong with me. All I know is that when Sam ministered to me, I quit with my back to the river and I turned around. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Now I'll close with this. Yesterday, while David and Betty and others are ministering, and I'm sitting over there, I'm observing, I'm observing how that they're ministering, you know, Brother Mark, how he's ministering to people. And I saw this in my spirit. I had a mini vision. And I saw it wasn't a river. It wasn't an ocean. It was something. It looked like mud, but it wasn't mud. It looked like chocolate icing, you know. But it wasn't chocolate icing. I can't describe it. I don't know what it was. But all I know is it was this huge, vast area. And it was all moving. And I knew that once this substance touched you, it stayed with you. It wouldn't just, you know, like water. You know how water would just run off of you? You just leave a little residue. This stick, it stuck. It stayed with you. And I noticed that this substance began to be channeled until it became one thin channel. All of it being dumped on us. Every one of us. The work of the Holy Ghost. That right there should cause us to make the decision. Man, I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. And I will add fasting to my praying. And I'll just see what God can do. Yes. And then one day we can say with confidence, you know, I'm in my place. I'm running my race. And the Spirit of grace will take me all the way through. Whoo, glory to God. Let's raise your hands and worship God. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 It is upon thee, the Word and the Spirit. It behooves thee to hear it, walk in the light of it. Know ye that ye are the sons and daughters of God. I have given to thee every bit of ground that you walk on. The sod. Hallelujah. Be quick. Be earnest. Fervent in spirit in everything you do. And all oh, that river will come upon you and pass through you all the way through. Shoo. Glory to God. Let's worship God. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. You know, <clears throat> the best thing that we can do 
not only in closing this service, but closing the conference, is to make a consecration. Decisions have presented themselves to us this week. Challenges have been offered. God's asked some of us to raise the bar. God's asked some of us to make some steps toward where we need to be so that we can go up higher. There's been some hindrances. There's been some blockages. There's been some strongholds. Things that have had to be moved out of the way. There's been some clarity that's come. Holy Spirit's been opening our eyes to see some things. Our hearts have taken hold of some things we needed to take hold of. And the Lord says, now it's time to just muse on what it is that He has done, things He has spoken, promises He's made, challenges He's offered, and say, yes, Lord, where Thou leadest, I will go. What you say, I will do. I want to go up higher. Alita, this is your song, right? Somebody, I think it was Mark, I can't remember who, prophesied over her about songs. That God wanted to take her new place this is what we can look forward to in her spending time in the presence of God because this is a song she wrote and I want us to close with this consecration this song is a consecration song let it be your cry as we bring this to an amen Sing this out of your heart to the Lord. He's
Just believe what I say Have childlike faith Oh, just believe what I say Oh, just believe what I say Oh, just believe what I say He's calling us showed me in that dream about the ceilings and I could get there with my faith and the word and I got to the next level of, of the ceiling with faith and the word and brother John you imparted something in the spirit you're a man of prayer and the Holy Ghost revealed to me when I consecrated myself I said God I want to go in that place you showed me where I soar and you know what he told me he said, your place to soar is in my realm of prayer. That's where you're going to soar. Because I can go places in that realm without any hindrances, without any restrictions. Can you get it? Do you see it? That's what the Holy Ghost is saying today. The Word and the Spirit. And I consecrated myself that I'm going to be able to pray out things that I've not been able to pray out before. I have prayed out something. I, look, I've been in some places in the Spirit. I've been in at, at, uh, intercession, supplication, agreements in the Holy Ghost. But God said, there's, there's more. And you're not going to be shut down. You're not going to be capped. Oh, oh my God. And I'm going to pray out some things. And the, and, the, and, the, and the spirit of prayer is on this church. And any church that will receive the spirit of prayer on them. You go out of here today, you go out in the spirit of prayer. You know what makes it so easy? The spirit. He takes hold of your infirmity. All you have to do is sacrifice and consecrate that place, that inner sanctuary, that house of prayer. Jesus got violent when they were doing other things against the house of prayer. And he drove it out, drive it out, drive it out, and let God do what he wants to do. Glory be to God. And that's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Your companion on your left and your companion on the right. 
the Word and the Spirit. Hallelujah. We're walking through life and we listen to the counsel of the Word and we listen to the counsel of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We do not turn to the left. We do not turn to the right. When it comes to the world, we let the Holy Ghost guide us. And we let the Word become a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we just pronounce a blessing on your people. Father, whatever else you want to release, we ask you just to move right now by your Spirit. Lord, even after this service is over and individuals are on their way home, Holy Spirit, just continue to speak to them. Continue to guide them and lead them. And Lord, may things begin to move that need to move. Things begin to change that need to change. Holy Spirit, right now, we thank you for, for just making a way in the wilderness to prepare for the Lord in each individual life, for his coming into greatness into their life. Father God, for there to be an uprising. Will there be an uprising, Father God? The things that have laid dormant will surface and begin to become activated again. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we put a blood block against the enemy. We strike a, a line in the spiritual sand and we say, you are off limits. Everything that's been deposited will remain and will not be shaken out of them. Nothing will be able to take what's been sown into them. And so we surround them with the Spirit of God and with the angels of God and we put a hedge around them in the Spirit that they'll go in the joy of the Lord and they'll go in the blessing of God. And this will carry them, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. One more time as we break and you fellowship each with each other and hug and be sensitive to each other. To just deposit your love and your care for each one. We're going to sing that one more time. God is calling us higher, and we're going to answer that call and go up higher. God bless you. He's calling us higher.